All right, guys, we are here with Grin Technologies. And Justin, Justin, how are you? Folks, I'm doing superb. Good. So uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with Grin, but you're about to get familiar with them. Justin's going to tell us about the hub motors that they make and what they're doing with them. So, Justin, tell us uh, about your motors starting out. Thanks, Gary, for the intro here. Uh, so the motor that we have, we've been calling it the all-axle hub motor. Uh, it's a direct drive motor, and we've been enthusiasts of direct drive motors since the very early days of the e bike industry. Um, so I personally got interested in e-bikes in 2004, that's 20 years ago, um, and that was when hub motors had just come onto the market and were really revolutionizing the potential for e-bikes in this very early adopter stage. Up to that point, any e-bike conversion involved substantial amounts of gearing, either friction drives on the tire or bolting sprockets to your wheel, and suddenly there's a solution of the motor integrated in the wheel, a direct swap. Um, and it's always held a soft spot in my heart as being just the ideal well of propelling a vehicle. Um, but what we saw is that China took over the dominance of motor manufacturing and just didn't innovate. They reached a stage where the motors worked, they worked well for their domestic market, but they didn't improve the compatibility to bicycle standards, which are always evolving in North America. And so things like disc brakes were very slow to come into the world of hub motors from China. Um, but then all the modern innovations related to through axle attachments to wheels on bike frames, to boost and super boost spacing, the hub motors were just left in the dust and were not an available propulsion option. So I always wanted to bring that simple, elegant drive technology to modern platforms. Um, so the idea for making our own motor kind of started in 2011, 2012. Uh, it took about six years before we actually had a first item in production. Um, and over those six years, the scope of what we could do started to increase. So in addition to working with you know, through axle bicycle forks, we also thought, well, this could also install very nicely in a single side mount. And that opens up the possibility of electrifying not just front and rear wheels where it's supported on a fork on both sides, but tadpole tricycles or delta trikes where you have a single side mounted wheel. Um, and so in the last few years, as we've seen uh, the enthusiasm for electric assist to span all modes of cycling, we've tried to make adapter systems to accommodate all the different makes and models of tadpole trikes that are out there so that you get this front motor option. And so what else? Joe? Yeah, so I mean, part of what we're, we see a bit of it, I mean, this show is so special to me because it's, it's a collection of all the you know, outside the box bicycle transportation modes. And one thing that most of these people appreciate and understand are the benefits of hub motors, which are often poo-pooed and understated in the normal bicycle world, which has been just enamored with Bosch and Shimano as your two drive systems. But those systems put all the mechanical propulsion through the pedal drive train, increasing the wear, um, and they don't have any potential for regenerative braking. And you'll hear if you go to a normal bike shop and ask about regen, they'll say, oh, it's nothing, it's a couple percent, it's just a, a you know, a, a, Mm -hmm. a silly perk that's of, of, of little merit. Um, but if you've actually ridden a bike with Regen, it is groundbreaking. It's like the most aha experience that you've ever had to feel the energy, the stored energy that you've put into pedaling suddenly come back into the battery, be available to use again. It just totally transforms the dynamics and the joy that you have in actually coming to a stop. Um, but it also massively increases the duration of time span between routine bicycle maintenance tasks. And so if you own a bike that you ride all the time, you are burning through brake pads, you're wearing through chains, you're wearing through cassettes, and you're wearing through your tires. And by putting the propulsion in the hub, all of that brake pad wear that you're used to dealing with from stopping is now taken care of electronically. All of the chain wear that you're not used to dealing with from the motor going through the chain is now reduced because most of the torque is done by the motors. Your chain pedaling effort is a lot less than on a non-electric bike. Uh, and the only thing that we don't solve is the problem of tire wear. And uh, what can I say? You'll have to replace your tires. The tires are still going <laughs> to roll on the road, right? So, um, yeah. I, I was going. So Trey had asked you. A a little bit earlier, I think mm -hmm. it's something that we need to discuss. So one of the drawbacks that is discussed also with hub motors is uh, heat mm -hmm. and how uh, it generates a lot of heat and can cause some problems. And you guys kind of have a, a way around that. Tell us what uh, you're doing. How do you view that? For sure. So I've studied motor temperature. I mean, that is it is the every motor. It's not a hub motor problem. Every motor, the limit to how much power and torque a motor can give is not determined magnetically. It's not a question of the iron or the, the, the magnets that are used. It's really a question of how can we get the heat out of it. Um, and so whether it's a mid-motor or a hub motor, you have to extract that heat. And a hub motor has a downside that climbing a hill at a low RPM, it's generating a lot of heat and doesn't have a lot of thermal flow to get it out of there. So we actually set up a wind tunnel at our shop in Vancouver to actually 
actually study with infrared cameras, temperature sensors, how much heat is being in the motors and how different cooling strategies work to cool it. A very common strategy 15 years ago was just to drill holes in the side of your motor. And that works stupendously well. Instead of having this trap air volume, now air can circulate through the motor and you can basically double the capability, the thermal power of a motor just by drilling holes, but you introduce a risk of sand, dirt, debris getting inside the motor. Uh, in practice, it really had little downsides, um, and if water got in the motor, it would just evaporate out. Um, but most people are overall nervous about opening the insides of the motor. Uh, another very common thought would be, well, why don't you just put oil in the motor to cool it? So that, of course, works. If you fill a motor with oil, you now can move the heat from the middle to the outside of the motor, but you have all of this drag. Not only do you have drag, you're never going to seal a motor against oil leaking. Oil will leak its way through ball bearings, it'll leak its way through the cables, it'll spill onto your disc rotors, suddenly your mechanical disc brakes don't work, and it adds a lot of viscous drag. So people will complain about a hub motor having a little bit of drag to spin. Well, you fill it with oil, you now have doubled or tripled that. Uh, so we had this brainwave that we were familiar with magnetic fluids, ferrofluids, and we thought, hey, well, with a ferrofluid, then the oil, you wouldn't have to fill the motor, it would just stick on the magnets, right. and then it wouldn't leak out of the motor. Wow. Uh, we tested that, and it worked as expected, but it also had a lot of drag um, because we filled the whole thing with ferrofluid. Nothing leaked, but it had the resistance. But as I was running the experiment, I didn't feel it very well, and it started to leak out. And I kept running the test, and the, the ferrofluid was splattering over the room, <laughs> over the wind tunnel, but I was monitoring the temperature, and it got to a point where almost all the ferrofluid had splattered out, and it still had the doubled thermal conductivity. And so I was baffled eureka. by this, a eureka. <laughs> I opened it up, and there was just you know five or six milliliters left, and it turned out that's all you needed. You just needed a few drops in order to bridge that gap, and a few drops doesn't cause that drag because so little of the surface area is covered. Mm -hmm. um, and so by just adding you know, 10 milliliters of this fluid, we now double the ability of that motor to shed heat, which can push the motors up a, a much higher grade climb, carry more loads, um, and just expand the bounds with which a given hub motor will work. Um, and that's a permanent seal, yeah? What, 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 does that need to be replaced? That's a great question. Uh, we've, we're up to now six years and running it. Um, I imagine after 20 or 30 years, there might be some chemical breakdown, but the products, ferrofluids, they've been used extensively both in hard drives, so in, in the original platter uh -huh. hard drives, that's how they sealed. They didn't have ball bearings to seal it. They would seal it with ferrofluids so no dust would get in, because if you get one speck of dust in a hard drive, that's going to mess up that whole sensitive reading platform. Um, they also use them in speakers, and in these applications, they, they're lasting years and years and years. Worst case, in 10 years, you might need to add another you know, half of a syringe full. Okay. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the other thing related to that hill climbing is that in a hub motor, because you're not geared, you're geared naturally by the size of the wheel, when you go to a smaller diameter wheel, you get a substantially better performance. And because recumbent bikes especially are prone to use 20 inch wheels, an actual hub motor does way, way better than it does on an upright bike where sort of 29 inches become the norm recently. Perfect. So let me ask you, let me ask you, Justin, about uh, your collaboration with any uh, trike manufacturers. So you talk about the tadpoles that you had. Uh, are you working with any manufacturers? Yeah, I, I would love to. So we're not directly working with them. We need to establish our credibility within this industry. Uh, my first experience on tadpole trikes was for the 2018 Sun Trip Solar Bike Race. Um, so that's been sort of a, an every other year. There's a, a group of 40 to 50 people compete in a fairly epic, you know, between five to ten thousand kilometer solar electric bike touring trip. You've never done that. <laughs> so 2018 what? I did that. Um, and uh, and I, I wanted to do a tandem bike that I could ride with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. Um, and the natural, because you're dealing with the solar, you need a solar roof, a trike is a way better platform than a bicycle. Um, so we found a tandem uh, TerraCycle Rover actually, uh, I think it was on Whidbey Island, just south of us in Vancouver. Um, picked that up and that became this platform on which we wanted to build an electric system. And that was my first time actually installing our motors on the side mount. So it let us understand how these side mounted hubs are basically built. Um, we did almost 6,000 kilometers from France to Iran on a tandem tricycle with two hub motors. Not a single issue with the motors, not a single broken spoke. We're going up through the Alps, 2,000 meter elevation gains on a daily basis. No problem with the hub motors overheating. There's a single point where we stopped to cool it down. Um, but most impressively was the regenerative braking. So we didn't once have to replace our brake pads. Uh, at one point, we got almost a kilowatt hour of energy back into the battery 
going down uh, right into the, the coast on the Caspian Sea. Yeah. Uh, and that proved to me that this was just such a viable um, uh, option. So what's basically happened since then is as we've had customers ask about it, we'd say, hey, send us the steering knuckle of your trike and then we'll CNC an adapter system in order to make it fit. Um, and we've now had customers um, from Ice Trike, uh, Free Cross is an elliptical system, uh, HP Velotechnic, we just finished that a couple months ago, um, and, uh, and these adapters, we basically came up with a fairly universal approach. Every single one of these types has a different hub standard, which is a bit annoying, as I'm sure you guys are super familiar with. Um, maybe there will be a conversion onto one spindle size, uh, but as it is now, almost all these trikes have a disc brake. We simply have a, a metal adapter plate that installs on the torque arm and then mounts underneath the disc bolt calipers. So that way, all of the torque of the motor is safely coupled to the disc calipers, um, and you don't really need any special machining tools or capability to fit the motor on a side. Sounds good. I think uh, that's about all we need to know, except I have one last question. Yeah. So no issues whatsoever on the Sun Trip with the motors. Were there any issues with the relationship? <laughs> it, uh, I would say it evolved in a very positive sense. We got married two weeks after uh, flying back from Iran to my hometown. It was our pre-marriage honeymoon, and uh, um, it was a good test of uh, compatibility there. There you go. It worked out well for uh, Justin. Maybe it'll work out well for you. So, all right. Thank you so much. Justin, it's great meeting you. Okay.